We are going to be covering Hebrews chapter 1, 1 through 4. This will be our smallest section that we cover the entire time, but this section is so packed with important information that we want to make sure we give it proper amount of time. Let's go ahead and bow for a word of prayer. God, we love you so much. We thank you that you love us and that you care about us. We thank you that you loved us enough to send your only begotten son to this earth to die on a cross for our sins, and that you have raised him from the dead and you seated him at your right hand. It's so comforting to know that your son, our savior, our mediator, our intercessor, is sitting right next to you on your throne. And we appreciate that. And it's through his name we pray, amen. All right, so a couple things as we get ready to go. If you want to make a comment, please raise your hand. They will bring a microphone over to you, and you are to speak directly into the top of the microphone. You are not to use your microphone, your hand, as a wand. If you want to use your hand, just put the microphone in the other hand, okay? That's all you got to do. What you have to say is very important. We all want to hear it. Not only do we want to hear it, but those who are watching online want to hear it as well. And people who might be listening to this next year or the year after that will benefit greatly from your insightful comments. So please raise your hand. And I would ask you to do this. If you anticipate that you want to answer a question, you have something on your piece of paper and you've thought about it, you know you want to say something, Try to raise your hand early enough so that the microphone runners can get the uh, microphone to you with enough time and it's not, we're not just waiting and you, you weren't going to comment, you wanted to comment, decided not to comment, and then all of a sudden when microphones are both free, you raise your hand and somebody has to walk to you. So if you know you're going to comment, I just ask you to raise your hand a little bit ahead of time so that we can uh, make sure that we keep the class flowing. By way of review, who wrote the book? Paul. All right. Smart Alec. Has he five push-ups for Brian right there? He doesn't, the, the author doesn't say who he is. He doesn't say, this is Paul, this is Peter, whatever, this is John. He doesn't say. So we don't know for sure who wrote it. Paul has been the one that most people throughout the last several decades or centuries have placed in it. I mean, even people early on thought Paul had written the book. We talked a little bit about some, maybe some obstacles to that. He didn't put his name on it. He usually put his name in the book. The writing is not very similar, has some similarities, but not that similar. And it is a very high level of Greek that he typically doesn't use. It is a, uh, usually people consider it to be a, a sermon transli- transli- or transcribed into a letter, which would give it a little different feel to it. So we've also noted Apollos, Barnabas, Luke. But the bottom line is, it doesn't really matter because it is from God and who the author is isn't his main source of credibility. What is his main source of credibility in writing the letter? You you can raise your hand or you can just shout that one out. Scripture, the Old Testament Scripture, right? So in other words, he's, he's saying the Old Testament Scripture that you all agree with is the authority for what I'm sharing with you. Carol? Just something that maybe wasn't brought up on Sunday is that I don't think there's really any place for the author's name in this book, especially <laughs> since he starts off with the superiority of Jesus. Would you want to put your name above that? <laughs> yeah, I think that there's, I mean, especially if this is a sermon, he, he, he starts off with a bang. He starts off with the attention getter right there in the first four verses. And so usually when Brian and I get up to give sermons, we don't tell you who we are, right? You just start right into it. Whether it's an introductory or whatever, you don't introduce yourself to it. But we did note that he was a Jew. He was a teacher. And he was somebody who did not learn the message while he was, Jesus was alive. You have Jesus You have those who heard Jesus, and then he lumps himself in with the people who he's writing to as those who heard it from those who heard Jesus. So I think that's an important aspect of it. And whoever he was that wrote the book, he had to have some kind of credibility with the people he sent it to. 
He knew that they would respect that train of thought and what he was saying. And so he was respected by them. And that also notes that it was a general letter to all Jewish Christians. It was a letter to a specific group of people. And so we don't know exactly who that is. So the audience, huh, it helps I hit the button. The audience, again, we're not sure. We could say that they're Jewish Christians who had suffered persecution. In Hebrews chapter 10, it talks about former days when they endured a great struggle with suffering, partly while the, you were made a spectacle both by reproaches and tribulation, and partly while you became companions to those who were so treated. And then in chapter 12, verse 4, it alludes to the fact that you haven't resisted yet to bloodshed. So it looks like there's a group of people who have suffered persecution, the taking of their properties, being made a, a, a public spectacle of, and that's beginning to wear on them. They're waning in their faith in Jesus. And he knows there's more trials coming. So we got to solidify your faith in Jesus right now. We can't let this go any further. So the purpose, I would say, is don't give up on Christ. Christ is awesome. And he is better than anything you have ever experienced in your life or ever can experience. And that's what this letter is going to teach the people that received it. Any thoughts or questions on that as far as we re the review that we just did? Okay, let's go ahead and read the text. Hebrews chapter 1, 1 through 4. It says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. And I, I highlighted a few words in red to sort of condense what he's saying here so we know what he's saying. God spoke to us through his son. Now, he spoke to the fathers through the prophets, but God spoke to us through the Son. And he talks about two different time periods here. One time period is time past. And so the time past, uh, it characterizes the communication that God had as various times. That carries with it the meaning of being more like a piecemeal approach? In other words, did any Old Testament prophet receive a complete revelation of God's entire plan at one time? No. I mean, it was like, all right, Moses got what Moses needed, and that was added to when another prophet came along. Elijah got what Elijah needed. Elisha got what he needed. All the Daniel, Isaiah, and all of them. Did they understand fully God's plan? As a matter of fact, they would have been delighted to know what we know. You know, they would have been, oh, the eyes opened up. Oh, that's where everything is going. Even angels aren't told everything in, uh, like, like the sun is. So there, there's this various times. It, it illustrates, and if you go through and look at all the times God communicated, it, he does communicate in the, in the major time periods in the Bible, and it's all through there, but none of it is complete. So it, it really represents the revelation that from old times, various times, it wasn't ever completed. There was always more revelation to come. They wanted more revelation. They were waiting for more information, and they would get it as they needed it. That would be hard. Uh, somebody used the example of you know, putting a puzzle together when they just, somebody just handed you one piece at a time. And how difficult that would be. You didn't have the box to look at, nothing. They just kept handing you a piece of the puzzle, and you're trying to put that together. Who knows you know, how it all goes together? And so that's sort of how the Old Testament prophets could figure out. They knew what they needed. God gave them exactly what they needed when they needed it, but he didn't give it all to them. And in various ways, and we'll talk about that in a minute in question number one, God spoke to the fathers through the prophets in very, very interesting ways. 
The fathers here aren't like just the patriarchs, aren't Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. They all your ancestors, your Jewish ancestors. That's what we, we, one of the verses we use to show that these were Jews and he spoke to them by the prophets. But in these last days, so you have in former days, times past, now you have these last days. He spoke to us by his son. And it carries with it the concept that he gave us his full and final and complete revelation because he was the son. He knew it all. He could deliver it all, not like any other prophet or not like any other angel. And we know that there are other passages in the Bible that talk about how the message was delivered once and for all. As a matter of fact, in Galatians, Paul says, if we or an angel were to come down and preach something different, let him be accursed. It was once delivered for all time. And so there's more of a complete final picture. And we know that Jesus said of himself in the Sermon on the Mount, I didn't come to destroy the law and the prophets. I didn't come to, what did I do? I come to make it all make sense. I came to fulfill the law and the prophets and complete the work God has started. In the rest of the verses, verses 2 and 3, the author is going to describe the Son in some majestic terminology, which we'll get to in just a moment. So then he goes on to set out to prove that Jesus is all these things from the Old Testament scripture. Were they able, how did they know these things up to this point? They knew it because they had heard it from those who had heard it from Jesus. And now that the persecution has come, maybe they're doubting the people who told them this. But the one thing that they would never doubt is the Old Testament scripture. And so the author is saying, all right. I'm going to show you how everything that you've heard from those who heard it from Christ is exactly what the Old Testament was talking about. And I think that's a very important part of all this as well. What would, these are Jewish Christians. So think about this for a second. What would they have believed about Jesus? Who he was. All right, Herb's got something. Everybody's going to wait to see what Herb says before they raise their hand. He might give the best answer. No, they're all going to wait until I don't get it right. Then they're going to fill in the, right. the correct part. Uh, he was Jehovah. He was God in the flesh. He was God come down from heaven. He was God's word, as John talked about in John 1. He was God that, that fulfilled the prophecy, uh, the, the Savior. Well, I'm still not looking for the, There's another word there I'm looking the Christ, for. The Christ, the Messiah? Yeah, Messiah. The anointed the Christ, one? Yes, he's the Messiah, who the Jews today are still looking for the Messiah. But he was the Messiah. Yeah, if you're a, a, a Christian, do you have to believe that Jesus is the Christ? I mean, that's the Messiah, right? That's the anointed one. That's something that you have to believe. Um, is, uh, John... 16:15 or Matthew 16:15 when they ask who do, who do men say that I am and all the answers they give different prophets Elijah John the Baptist it says who do you say that I am what was Peter's response you are the Christ the Messiah the son of the living God so Peter knew that so who do you, you think Peter would have told those who heard Peter who then told these people? Absolutely, he would have told them that. That was key. As a matter of fact, in John chapter 6, again, Jesus is talking, a lot of John chapter 6, Jesus is talking about he's the bread that's come down from heaven. And they have to eat his flesh. And that was confusing to them, so some disciples walked no longer with him. But when Jesus looked at Peter and says, do you want to go away too? Peter says, no, we, you have the words of life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. In John 11, when Martha, the conversation with Martha, you know, I know your, your, your brother will live again. I know he'll live in the, in the final, the last resurrection. I am the resurrection, the truth and the life. And then he, she goes on to ask him, uh, he goes on to ask Whoever, believe, whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming to the world. And then in Acts chapter 8, when you have the Ethiopian eunuch, and where does he start? He starts with Scripture, Old Testament Scripture, right? Isaiah chapter 53. And he preaches Jesus to him. And when the Ethiopian eunuch sees water, what does he say? Can I be baptized? What hinders me? There's some water. And what does... 
What does Philip say? You can't if you believe. And do you remember the confession that he made? I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So I believe Jesus Messiah, Jesus anointed one, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So at some point when they became Christians, they had to at least have some kind of knowledge and understanding and belief in those facts. What happens sometimes, though, when we have a belief in some things and persecution comes? Rethink. <laughs> We're rethinking. And doubt comes in, doesn't it? Because it's so much easier, and their way of thinking is so much easier. If we, and sometimes their way of thinking about Christianity was almost like Judaism plus Christ. I mean, it's just the Jewish religion plus Christ. Do we really need the plus Christ? Can we just go back to these great prophets and Moses and all these other things and save ourselves the trouble of persecution? And I can't say for sure that if persecution became so great that all of us would stick strongly to our convictions and we might not try to rationalize or justify certain areas and actions in order to uh, save ourselves from trouble. And the Hebrew writer isn't the only one that has gone back to the Old Testament to show that Jesus was who he said he was. That was one thing that Paul did on a regular basis. As a matter of fact, in Acts 17, actually, Paul and Apollos both are stated to do this. Uh, in Acts 17, in verse 2, Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them for three Sabbaths, reasoning with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, "Jesus, This Jesus whom I preached to you is the Christ. And it says a similar thing about Apollos, how, and that's in Acts chapter 18, if you're taking notes, 24 through 28, how he vigorously, in verse 28, refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Messiah. So it's not an unheard of tactic to go back to the Old Testament when talking to Jews to show that Jesus not only is the Christ, the Messiah, but the Son of God. And I, and I think there's, there was... One of those is easier to believe than the other. The Messiah claim, I think, is easier to believe than the other. They, they viewed the Messiah as an exalted king, but they did not place always the, the Messiah as God's son. And that's one of the things that he's going back and going to, uh, to, to deal with. So let's go ahead and go answer question number one. And that is, what, in what ways did God communicate to people in time past? A whole bunch of people have to have answers for this one. Come on, there's a lot of good ones here. Raise your hand. All right, Phil's got one, and then Joe's got one. Bill. Uh, the one I think of the most is Adam in the garden, when he spoke to him face to face. All right, That's so, the big one that stands out, plus Moses at the tent meeting. All right, so, so face to face. You were story at the very end. You couldn't right, So face to face. Adam in the garden was a very close, intimate discussion. And then uh, Moses, right? He's going to say, and we'll look, maybe look at this verse later, to most of my prophets, I communicate to them this way. I won't tell you because that might be one of the answers you have left. But to Moses, I speak to him face to face as a friend speaks to a friend. So there were times in the Bible where God spoke directly to people. God spoke directly to Cain. God spoke directly to Job. God spoke directly to all the children of Israel from Mount Sinai when he told them specifically his voice, all the Ten Commandments. And the reaction was, we can't bear to listen to this. So over and over and over, Elijah hears the voice of God, but it's in a, 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 a quieter tone, right? A quiet voice. Joe? Uh, sort of piggybacking on that. So uh, through the Father's through Moses, Moses would tell other people okay. after he had already been told by God himself. Yeah. So indirectly through the patriarchs, if yeah. you will. Through the, through the fathers in the patriarch time period or through other prophets in other time periods. So sometimes God would speak to a person, a prophet or father of a family, and then that father or prophet then would go and tell the message to other people. Rachel? 
Uh, he would communicate through dreams. Uh, Joseph would interpret those dreams. Yes, dreams were, was a pretty common way. That's one of the two ways that he says, I, used, I usually speak to prophets in dreams and blank, but I speak to Moses face to face. You have Abimelech was warned because he had taken Sarah into his harem that she belonged to another man. That wasn't a dream. Jacob had dreams. Sometimes we don't realize Jacob had a couple pretty major dreams. One was the speckled and the spotted lambs jumping around. That's how he knew how God was going to take care of him. Laban had a dream to leave, let Jacob go. Don't say anything bad about him, right? Just don't say anything good or bad. That was a dream. Joseph had dreams. Uh, the cupbearer and the baker had dreams. Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, had two dreams. Uh, Gideon's, one of his enemies, had a dream about the barley loaf, right? And then he overheard that, and he overheard the interpretation of that dream. That's no less than Gideon and how he is going to have success. Solomon's first time God talked to him, it said it was in a dream. In the New Testament, Joseph, Mary's husband, had four different dreams. One, take Mary as your wife. Two, leave for Egypt. Three, go back to Egypt. And four, but don't go back to Judea. So he had four different dreams. Pilate's wife had a nightmare. Right? Don't have anything to do with that just man. So dreams was a way that God communicated certain things to people. Brian? Sometimes through angels as well. Yeah, to angels. Even, even the Old Testament, the law of Moses, I should say, is talked about in a couple passages as being delivered by and through angels. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll save that one. Go ahead, Herb. Yeah. Visions. He says visions. All right. So sometimes through dream, dreams testing, and sometimes. Testing. There you go. Go ahead. Finish your thought. Visions. <laughs> there you go. And I've had a vision. That is, that is the other blank. Dreams and visions. And it seems like the major difference between a dream and a vision is the dream, they were asleep, and the vision, a lot of times they were awake. As a matter of fact, that's what he says. Back in Numbers chapter 12, this is Aaron and Miriam have stood up against Moses, and God calls all three of them to the tabernacle. You remember that? And then he says, basically, Aaron and Miriam, come here, I want to talk to you for a few minutes. And that would be very scary. And so he really says to them, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in dreams. Not so with my servant Moses. So visions and dreams. Samuel was really a vision, not a dream. He, he was having, he heard the voice, ran into Eli. Eli says, go back to bed. He goes, three times that happens. Finally, Eli says, next time you hear the voice, say, here I am, Lord, speak. And so he was awake when he heard that vision. As a matter of fact, it says in 1 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 16, And Samuel was afraid to tell Eli the vision that he had seen. Remember, Eli says, no, speak it to me, tell me the truth. And it was a very bad message for Eli and his family. We got Tim over there has something. Zacharias is John the Baptist's dad is said to have seen a vision. The people thought he saw a vision, but it, it appears that he saw the angel there, there by the side of the, of the altar of incense. And then Peter on the roof. He was, it wasn't night, he wasn't asleep. He was up there thinking and when he fell into a trance and then he saw the vision. So you have both dreams and visions, Tim. Handwriting on the wall. Handwriting on the wall, right? Yeah, so he, 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 that's in Daniel. He had the hand, Daniel 5, 5, 5 through 6. A very unique way to communicate. A guy sees a hand, and all of a sudden, in the plaster, he writes this message. And, oh, what does that mean? We have no idea. All the magicians come in. We don't know what that means. I hear there's a Daniel. And he's, he's been pretty good at all this stuff. And they bring Daniel in, and Daniel's able to interpret that as well. So uh, there was a wrestling match, right? So in the middle of a wrestling match. Uh, the angel speaks to, it's, and some people think that when it refers to the angel of the Lord, that that might be an incarnation of Jesus. I'm not sure that that's the case. It, it, it's possible, but on that particular, through a burning bush, right? That's pretty interesting. Where, where do you put uh, Daniel and the three men in the fire? What, what, what category would you put that in? I don't know. An angel? 
Yeah, that, that's another one that people, some people think was actually Jesus. Oh, okay. So, or an angel, one as if the son of man. So, so it's hard to know where to put that. Is that I what don't you're know saying? where to put that one. I don't know if, how much, yeah, I guess his presence D- communicated something Directly sure. or not so much? I have non-verbal A vision? Being there? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Randy? A donkey. Talking donkey, right? <laughs> And the, the, uh, that was Joe's, right? Uh, so you have this, uh, there Balaam, the, the, donk, the donkey talks to him. And finally he says, you know, why are you, why are you beating me? And then he has this conversation. I've been your donkey for a long time. I've never done this before. Shouldn't you get the clue that there's something troubling me that I would do these kind of things? And then all of a sudden God opened his eyes and there's the angel before him. and said, man, you would have died if it wasn't for that donkey. And the angel then asked, why are you beating the donkey? Carol? He spoke through nature. Okay. Uh, That's not one that I have very good. The Ten Commandments, we saw saw nature speaking quite rapidly through there. Yeah, very good. As a matter of fact, even when they were yelling out for Jesus in the New Testament, what are they told? Don't tell them to shut up because if they shut up, what's going to happen? The rocks will even speak, you know, so God has the ability to speak through rocks, through nature, everything that he has the ability to speak through. So there's a whole lot of ways God spoke to people in the Old Testament. And we would say the people who experienced those, could you see how this would be tempting? The people who experienced those things, it would be easy to put them up on a higher plane than everybody else. And so what they've started to do now is they're seeing Moses and they're seeing Abraham and they're seeing the high priest and they're seeing all these other guys. And then they're sort of saying, maybe they're better than Jesus. After he was, he was just a man. He was a man. And so they start struggling with this as it, as it, as it goes through all of, all of what's going on here. Jesus tells, a, turn to Matthew 21. Jesus tells a parable that illustrates that this was going to happen. And I think it's a very, very powerful parable. It's the, pow- it's the parable of the landowner. He planted the vineyard, remember? And, and then when the owner of the vineyard wanted what belonged to him, he sent whom first? Who did he sent to go get his, his, his cut? The servants. All right. Second time, who does he send? Servant. I think the three times he sends servants. Who does he finally send thinking that they will respect my son? He sends the son, right? Surely they will respect my son. They won't hurt him. And Jesus lambasts them here when he makes the point crystal clear to them that your fathers killed the servants, the prophets. You killed you're going to kill the son. And yet you think you're better than your fathers. This made them so mad. I mean, they knew when Jesus got done speaking, they're like, oh man, that guy's talking about us. You know, we're the ones that the kingdom's getting taken away from. We can't have that. And it got them so angry that they wanted to kill Jesus. So that's just a very powerful thing that Jesus lets them know ahead of time. There's going to be some other teachings of Jesus that will come up as we go along. So question number two. All right, what are the seven, and I put credentials in quotes. They're all they're mentioned in different ways. And I gave you the first one so that you would know where I was going with this on the, on the, on the questions. But before we get into those seven, the overriding major thing that makes Jesus different than everything he's going to talk in the book of Hebrews, every person, every group, everyone he's going to talk about, is that Jesus is the Son. In verse 4, it's what he comes back. He's inherited a more excellent name. The name is Son. So right the parable, right? It's not, he's not a servant. He's not a, pro, uh, and he's not a, he's not a servant. I'm going to, I don't want to get too much. I started studying for Sunday already. I'm not, I don't want to blow the Sunday stuff, but he, he is the son and that carries with it some very significant privileges that no one else has. So the first one is the one I gave you. And so you can tell me what the significance of this is. In verse two, talking about Jesus, it says, whom he appointed heir of all things. 
I wasn't going to answer that one, sorry. All right. I was going to do number two. <laughs> okay. He's doing number two. We're going to go in order. <laughs> okay. It would be so much easier if we just go and order the text. Somebody has something for number one, the significance of whom he has appointed heir of all things. Let me, let me, let's think about it this way. Joe, Joe has something. Joe, he has a, oh, he's like this. Uh, you, you go like this. You, you, I'm an auctioneer. So, right there, all right. So, look at Abraham. Did Abraham have multiple sons? We had Ishmael and he had Isaac. What happened once uh, Sarah died? He married Keturah and he had multi multiple sons. But who was the heir? How many heirs were there that One. could be called the heir? One. Isaac, right? As a matter of fact, when Abraham was getting old, before he died, what did he do to make sure everyone knew who the heir was? He gave him some gifts, sent the other sons to the east, and the Bible says he gave all that he had to Isaac. Because Isaac was the only heir, and he stood at a totally different level than all the other sons of Abraham. And so the Bible talks about, I mean, in 1 John chapter 3, what are we called? Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that no, we're the children of God. Children. But are we the children of God like Jesus is the Son of God? Oh, no. God. Even angels in the book of Job, it talks about how they were assembled there at, at the meeting that when all the angels were there and they had the uh, the devil was also present when God had that conversation about Job. So the point he's making is he's not on that level. He is the heir. He's way above everybody else. Joe? Yeah, well, it starts off with, uh, with the two words, whom he, and the he is God. So it starts off right from the beginning that the greatest, you know, the highest, if you could, I, I don't know how to explain it, the highest order of, of uh, authority is the one declaring that. So yeah. this is not, oh, this is somebody I heard last night. Or, no, 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 no. This is the top guy is saying this is my ear. Yeah, I mean, that really settles it for most of us, God said, right? Yeah. That's what, that's... If God says he's the heir, then what does that mean? He's the heir. He is the, the heir. As a matter of fact, who, after David, who was it determined that was going to be the next, who was going to be the next king? It was determined by God and David. Who, who, who had the right to say who the next king was? God and David, right? Did Adonijah have the right to say he was king? But he tried, right? He tried to say, I'm king. He gathered a whole bunch of people. Joab followed him and said, got the chariots running before me. I am the new king. I am the new king. And David was like, no, 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 no. You know, Nathan and Bathsheba go, you don't have the authority to claim yourself to be something that you're not. God says the next king is Solomon. And he is the one that has the authority. Herb? Number two. Anybody have anything else on number one before we? All right, Herb, number two. What is number two? Well, I love this. Jesus was there at the beginning. He helped with creation, through whom he also created all things. Jesus was there. Nobody else can claim that. Yeah, so there, there, there might be, they're waffling. Uh, is Jesus just the Messiah, an, a, an elevated king? In other words, he'd be human, right? He'd be human. And then if, if that's the case, he's still probably lower than the angels, and he's definitely lower than God. And he makes this point here to, to elevate Jesus. Jesus wasn't just a created being that came to life when he was born on this earth. And so he, he, he reaches back to probably one of the most powerful proofs that Jesus is God. And Jesus is worthy of all the accolades and all the stuff that he's trying to get him to hold fast to is creator. Isn't that God, as creator, has inherent authority because he made everything. And so the Hebrew writer is saying God made everything, but Jesus, he made it through Jesus. So he was in there at the beginning. Uh, John 1 talks about this. Other passages in the Bible talk about this as well. Colossians 1.16, 1 
For by him all things were created. They're in heaven and they're on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions. You see how reminding, I think that they're being reminded of things they probably already have heard and known at some level. Now they're being reminded by proof of the Old Testament scriptures as he, as he goes on. So the, the, second, uh, the third one there, um, well, you have, mine got, all, mine got all of order. That automatic numbering sometimes, it just, it changes the numbers and then I'm all messed up. All right, so it says, who being the brightness of his glory. And so when you see the glory of Jesus, you see the glory of the Father. And there's several other passages that talk about this. Second Chronicles 4 and verse 6 says, For it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. John 1, 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So if you see the glory of Jesus, you see a representation of the glory of the Father. The next thing he states there is the express image of his person. Remember John 14? I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm going to prepare a place for you and all that good stuff. And you get down to a conversation that Jesus has with Philip. where Show us the Father. That's all we want to do is just show us the Father. And what does Jesus say? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And then in Colossians 1 and verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God. And Jesus claims very boldly, before Abraham was, I am. So Jesus was claiming deity, right? He was claiming to be God. The next one is upholding all things by the word of his power. So not only did he create everything, but he has the power, his word has the power to keep everything going the way it is. And if it wasn't for him, everything, the whole world would collapse in. He has the power. All things consist through him. Uh, Colossians 1.17, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And then... When he had by himself purged our sins. Angels didn't do that. Moses didn't do that. High priest didn't do that. He is the one that purged our sins. So what we have in, in three of these things that he mentions here, creator, sustainer, and redeemer. That's pretty powerful because no one else can claim anything near like that. Uh, this implies that the former system former days really couldn't cleanse us of sin. As a matter of fact, it's going to come back to that in chapter 10, for it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. John writes in 1 John 1 and verse 7, we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, the one they're talking about, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And then the last thing, which is, we talked on Sunday about this, this is the clincher. I mean, to me, this is the clincher, right? Because if all these other things are true, but Jesus never went back into heaven and never sat at the right hand of the majesty on high, then they might have some kind of a case that maybe he wasn't as good as some others. Who, uh, angels are in heaven, right? Angels are in the presence of God. So if angels are in the presence of God and this Jesus is in the presence of God, maybe angels are better uh, than Jesus and so the Hebrew writer makes it very clear. Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the throne of God. The setting, I think, just it shows a finality, a, a, a victory. That doesn't mean that Jesus doesn't intercede or mediate for us. not like he's done with everything. But it's proximity to uh, the Father. And it's a completion, which is in total contrast to the Old Testament system, which was never really complete. It was never finished. Sins weren't totally taken care of. The, the, the prophecy wasn't finished until Jesus came, and that's what made it all right. And just, we have 15 seconds. The right hand symbolizes power. It symbolizes importance. When Ezra stood on the platform, it lists who was on his right hand. So it's authority, it's blessing. And I, I was, as you go through the book of Psalms, you'll find out how often it attributes things to God's right hand. It says in Psalm 1611, You will show me the path of life, and your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand 
are pleasures forever. And then in Matthew chapter 25, what's going to happen to those on the left hand? Not so good. Those on the right hand are going to be called in to the Father. And Jesus told the high priest this. Jesus says this in Matthew 26, 64. It is as you said, nevertheless I say to you hereafter, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Boy, he starts this sermon out as, with an attention getter, right? Now he's going to go back and, and go through all these things and, and spell it out through the Old Testament scriptures. But I think if you were listening to this, if you were there while this sermon was delivered, or if you heard this in letter form, you'd almost say, time out. <laughs> I mean, i got to digest this for a few minutes because he really gave him a whole bunch of, it's like drinking through the uh, fire hose. You just give him a whole lot of information. All right, I have questions for Sunday. Sunday, we'll cover more material, verses 5 to chapter 2 and verse 4.